Hey everybody, welcome back to Frost Christman. We are on our third episode. Uh, last week we kind of, you know, broke our, our mission statement just to give you a kind of sampler platter of our tastes and our distastes. Uh, many bombs were thrown. And uh, this week we're actually back sort of on theme and we decided to do an episode on the Olympics. Um, so I am here again with my co-host, Matt Chrisman, a.k.a. Kushbomb. Hi, everybody. And um, we talked about this earlier, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning because our listeners might be, like, really shocked to find out that neither of us were jocks growing up. I mean, we, yeah, we have such I a... Yeah, I feel comfortable finally admitting that. Yeah, we have such a sporty, sporty vibe about us. Um, I, I like did ballet, which is like when you want to work really hard but still be very unpopular. Um, and you, yeah. uh, I believe, lettered in. Uh, I lettered. I got in junior high. I got a letter in drama. Yeah. That I yeah. tried to hide from my father because I was worried he'd think I was gay. And I did, before that, I had a very, very unillustrious sporting career. I, I really did try because my dad liked sports and I was like, I wanted to, you know, make him happy. So I tried to do a bunch of stuff in elementary school and they all failed miserably. I was on a terrible softball team that lost all the time. I was on a really bad basketball team that lost all the time. And then I briefly tried to be a wrestler, but in our first meet at our opponent's gymnasium at their school, I realized in my very first match, oh shit, I'm claustrophobic. And I had a panic attack right there on the mat, and I had to like wander, waddle away and like suck up a bunch of water in the hallway while taking big gasps of air with my dad standing behind me, so... Yeah, not much yeah. of a sports adept. Yeah. Does your dad know that you're not gay now? Sadly, he uh, he passed away before he had a chance to ever find out for sure that I wasn't gay. So he probably oh. went to his grave with at least like a 30% suspicion that I was. Yeah. And now yeah. Well, I realize, hey, you know, that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. These are the these are the moments of life. Indeed. Um, so yeah, despite that, I think we both like sports movies, even though sports culture is very foreign to us. Um, uh, at least I know that I do. Um, even oh, the yeah. corny ones, yeah. Um, so I suggested we start with like literally the most famous. Uh, Olympics movie out there and the most infamous uh, 1936's uh, Olympia Lenny Riefenstahl's documentary on the summer games in Berlin hell yeah yeah um, so it's a weird movie to watch for a number of reasons uh, one because it's like inarguably like a groundbreaking film like it used these really innovative uh, filming techniques and these you know, extreme close-ups that, you know, had never been used before, and uh, there's, like, weird, like, crane work and, and shots in the stands, and, um, yeah, it's a really influential film that also happens to be a piece of Nazi propaganda. Um, I It's, like, over three hours long, so I don't think I need to, you know, recommend that anyone who isn't sort of a nerd about this stuff uh, watch it, but... It is worth, I think, watching the intro, like, the first ten minutes, because it's, it's, like, remarkably stylized, um, and basically it opens up on, like, ruins, you know, you see columns, and then that, like, gives way to, like, statuary, and then the statuary, like, suddenly moves, and you realize, like, that actually these are not, you know, uh, you know, ancient Greek marble statues, but just, like, physically perfect human beings. Um, and then it migrates to sort of, like, a, this 
you know, imagined historic Olympic montage, um, lots of nudity, uh, and then it transitions to the actual documentary, which is, you know, off and on sort of interesting. She does do some interesting things uh, with slow-mo and gets, like, really good sort of shots of um, athletes in slow motion that, that otherwise would just look weird and awkward and, uh, you know, graceless. Um, But you'll notice she really, you know, takes her time with the slow-mo on the the German athletes and the Polish athletes and maybe doesn't do slow-mo for certain other, uh, certain other athletes. Um, But uh, yeah, one of the things we both noticed was, like, in terms of difference, like, the bodies are incredibly different of, of what yeah. we think of athletes being. Yeah, like, it's really weird. I, I did not know that back then that guys would compete in signif- serious track and field events while wearing dress slacks. Yeah. Like, a lot of these dudes, they look like Fred Mertz. Yeah. They look like the chubby neighbor on a, a, on a sitcom. And they're, yeah, like, yeah. curling discuses around. Yeah, like, Carol O'Connor is going to win a gold medal for Finland and in, in his regular clothes, too. And yeah, this looks like ones, he just walked onto the pitch, like, hey, what are you guys doing? Yeah, yeah. And the other ones, like, look like they're starving. Like, some of the runners just look, you just look emaciated compared to, to you know, athletes now. Yeah, um, not a lot of tone. Yeah, yeah, they just, like look very like you can see muscle but it's only because they have no fat um and the way they play the sports are very different like it's like they didn't know how to play sports yet uh there was no like perfected like technique yet to you know like something like the high jump or whatever so everyone would do it a different way and would just like flail over the bar and and it looked like none of them are going to make it because it, they just look like you know a mess of limbs of skinny starving limbs we had yeah, figured it's, it's, out it, how to be athletes yeah. yet we yeah exactly what we see now in in contemporary sporting events really is uh the culmination of like a hundred years of experimentation where people have figured out in every event something as simple as running to something that's more mechanically difficult, like pole vaulting. Like the Fosbury flop, for example, that you see every athlete do in pole vaulting, that wasn't invented until the 60s. Uh, Yeah. uh, So before that, yeah, people were just basically trying everything. Uh, And the four-minute mile wasn't run until the 50s. Like, you'd think that, how fucking hard is it to run? But apparently it takes a lot of experimentation to figure out exactly how to do those things most efficiently. And we're seeing that now. Like, we watch the Olympics and we're watching this perfect distillation of a hundred years of, of uh, sporting experimentation, whereas in the 36 games, it's just people randomly flailing around and hoping they don't kill themselves. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's insane how much precision now goes into it. And not just with, like, you know, with, like, body types, but, like, with training and with dieting and probably with drugs. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And just all a matter of regimentation and, like, just... I mean, like, there are, the, the, the overwhelming kind of, like, Nazi tones of, of uh, the movie come f- from a few things. One, you see Hitler all the time, which is, like... A lot of Hitler. It's just, like, a lot of shots of, like, an antsy, jittery Hitler, who's probably on all kinds of speed... Oh, yeah, he was totally brolin' for all of that. Yeah. And it's super strange, too, because, like, like yeah, okay, like, you know, Berlin's hosting the games, but I can't think of any other Olympics, at least, like, in my lifetime, where they just keep cutting to, you know, the head of state. Like, yeah. it's, it's very weird. It's a very, it's a distractingly Hitler-heavy movie. <laughs> like... I mean, yeah, um, you kind of expect a bit of Hitler when you're watching a movie about the 36 Olympics, but yeah, there's a lot of Hitler. And just the fact that he's in that uniform, you know, yeah. we're just really not used to seeing 
the guys in the stands kitted out in military ensembles like that with the hats and shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, yeah, like, badass Garing, I think, is in the stands, too. Um, but, you know, everything was wrapped in that. I mean, even Riefenstahl, who somehow managed to avoid being imprisoned uh, because she claimed, oh, I'm just an artist, I'm misunderstood. Like, there are photos of her wearing a uniform. And, like, she also saw people, like, mass executed and, you know, like just kind of kept going and ignored it or whatever. But, like, everything has has, has a bit of a, a Nazi sheen to it. The actual announce it, announcements on it aren't... I mean, I, they wouldn't be, obviously. Like, people are trying to be, like, diplomatic. But there are moments where they'll, like, refer to, like, a, a hurdles jumper. Uh, Fritz Pollard as Pollard the Black. And you're like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's not a nationality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's kind of that the, the Olympics themselves are like kind of a little bit fascist anyway, because they're about like bodily yeah. perfection. Yes. Uh, tri- yeah. The triumph of the will, literally. Yeah. They're, um, they're inherently, um, you know, you know, gender dichotomy. Remember the thing recently with the Castor Semenya? the South African runner who has some sort of um, genetic uh, anomaly that makes her, like, intersex by, by some definitions, and people were, like, trying to maybe keep her out of the games. Like, yes, yes. Sort of, yeah, sort of creepy stuff. Um, and then, you know, it's it's all very nationalist, which is, like, you know, it, at least as, you know, nation is at least an arbitra- as arbitrary as race. So... It's. I mean, I. I like the Olympics, but they are. They they got a touch of the fash, on them. Yeah. Well, and we're living in the shadow of the thirty six games in a lot of ways. Uh, like things that we take for granted, a lot of them were invented, by the thirty six games, like the torch bearing ceremony. They yeah. were the first yeah. ones to do that, and we've been carrying it on ever since. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, I think the intro is kind of interesting and worth watching the only other thing that i think is like truly worth watching is and again i'm not a huge sports person um but jesse owens like this was the olympics of jesse owens and this was before they measured races in like thousandths of a second or whatever Mm -hmm. uh because they didn't you know they, they didn't really have to there was enough distance or whatever uh but it's insane. He was just like multiple bodies ahead of everyone. And he was such a superior athlete to everyone he was competing against. And uh, like the best thing, and you can find it on YouTube, and I totally recommend you look it up. He, uh, he did the long jump and it's like two minutes of film, but other people before him, you know, you jump and you try and land forward because your jump distance is determined by uh, the closest, you know, uh, mark you make in the sand to your jump point. So you don't want to fall backward because, you know, if you fall backwards on your hands, your hands are how far you jumped. So everyone would sort of just land and then, like, land on their feet and sort of, like, fall down into a crouch and try and jump forward he like would like land and like spring up and it's the most it's just like i can't physically like it makes my knees hurt watching it um yeah and it was this incredible moment also because it was like a yeah 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 and as a black athlete at an olympics when the announcer was literally referring to black athletes as ah the black like regardless of their of their nationality um, yeah, and the movie and the movie shows him doing a lot of. I mean, he there's a lot of Germans getting owned in this movie for a movie that's supposed to yeah. be advertising for racial superiority. Uh, there's a lot of the Germans just getting their asses kicked at a lot of these events. Yeah, they make a like decent showing here and there, but it's not. It's obviously not like the, you know. It, it would not be used to endorse them uh, as the master race. It's not. Yeah. Uh, this this was should would they would leave this off their resume. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's sort of. Um, it was. I think it's a, a milestone in the change in the way that white supremacy is conceived of, because now it's a commonplace of white supremacy that blacks are superior athletically, but inferior mentally. But earlier in the twentieth century, uh, white supremacy meant that it meant white supremacy uh, in athletics and in intellect and in everything, and. So if you were to take your, your common, you know, basement Nazi who's like, well, yes, of course the blacks are good at those athletic events, but they don't have my superior mind. And you took yeah. him back and had him talk to one of these early uh, generations of, like, modern white supremacists, they'd say, what, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have yeah. faith in the white race to conquer with their bodies and minds? Yeah. It just shows uh, how arbitrary and sh- ever-shifting it is as a concept. Yeah, well, it has to. I mean, like, say what you will about, like, the bullshit of liberal multiculturalism. It at least forces, at least keeps racism on its toes. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, gotta keep moving. Gotta keep bobbing and weaving. Yeah. But, uh, but you so, actually, okay, so uh, you, you watched the Jesse yeah. Owens movie. So speaking of Jesse Owens, uh, I figured, okay, we're talking about the 36 Olympics, we're talking about Olympia. I'm going to watch this movie that came out last year called Race. And this is a movie that I never in a million years thought that I would watch because it looked like just really dreary Oscar bait about, you know, a a brave black man and 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 an open-minded white man going to Berlin and and proving racism wrong and, you know, standing up and all that stuff. And, you know, just it's basically a carbon copy of that movie about... Uh, 42, that movie about Jackie Robinson that came out like a year before that and it's just so I was not looking forward to watching it but I figured it might be interesting as a, as a companion piece to Olympia and holy crap was it ever so the thing that was really surprising and kind of delightful to watch in this is that so the main heroes are of course Jesse Owens played by Stephen James and his uh, track and field coach at Ohio State, played by former SNL cast member Jason Sudeikis. So they have the pretty conventional stories of you know uh, conquering discrimination and all that stuff, and it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty much what you'd expect. What was a real surprise is that like the secondary hero, like the the kind of the protagonist who has a arc and a triumph that's parallel to Jesse Owens and complimentary and then comes together at the end, Lenny Riefenstahl. Oh my god. Yes. Uh, as what? played by, uh, yes, as played by Chris Van uh, Houten, uh, otherwise known as Melisandre from Game of Thrones. Uh, they show her, like, as Jesse Owens is getting ready to do the Olympics, they cut repeatedly to her getting ready to shoot this documentary. And it's all about, at least her scenes, are all about her struggle to, like, overcome the sexism of the other Nazis and, like, Goebbels in order to oh make the god. movie that she wants. Oh my god, I'm with her. It's really astounding. <laughs> oh god, it's something. Like, there's a whole scene where she shoots some footage and Goebbels is watching it and he's, like, trying to pretend that he's not impressed with it. And then he's talking to her, and of course, because she's Lenny Riefenstahl, she's wearing like a men's shirt and jodhapurs or whatever, and Goebbels goes to her, do you think you look attractive in that dra- in that shirt? And so like, it sets up at her as like, oh yes, well, Jesse Owens is struggling to overcome racism on the field, Lenny Riefenstahl is struggling to overcome sexism off the field. Oh, it was the online harassment of its day. It was. It's like these gamer ga- these Nazi gamer gators didn't want to let Lenny Riefenstahl shine. Oh my but god. But thankfully she okay, was so able for, yeah. My favorite I, I have a few favorite uh Lenny Riefenstahl anecdotes because I think she's a fascinating figure because you know, like we moralize art so much now, um, in a way that I think is counterproductive, yet historically we've let actually like criminal artists you know uh, partake in atrocities um but Lenny Riefenstahl didn't have enough extras 
uh, for uh, a 1940 movie uh, called uh, Lowlands or Tiefland. And so she went to the labor camp at Max Glen and got 51 Roma inmates and used them uh, for extras. And then when she was done, she deported them to Auschwitz. Look, all right, if you're going to... How just did this woman not nitpick, go to jail? How did this woman not go to jail? If you're just going to nitpick a woman's accomplishments, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I mean... It's insane. It's like you don't want women to succeed. I'm, I'm just... She also, I'm sad she witnessed, you, you want to point out things like that. She witnessed mass shootings, mass burials, and at the end of her career, she was just like, oh, I misunderstood. I... I, I wasn't political. Like, first of all, you were, like, literally Hitler's favorite person. Like, she would have, like, these weird, like, histrionic things where she would be hospitalized for exhaustion, and he would show up personally and bring her flowers and shit. She, like, witnessed atrocities. She knew exactly what was going on. She wore the fucking uniform. And... God, it's just... You know what? You know what, Amber? There's a special <laughs> place in hell for women who weren't support other women, Okay. That's all I know. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm I'm so anti feminist right now. It, it's disgusting. I'm really disappointed in you right now. But it, it <laughs> actually it, the movie myself. is kind of a perfect distillation of like the the uh, personalized sort of neoliberal ideology of the contemporary sports film where like because there's actually a subplot, another subplot where people are and this was based on reality where people were telling, including the local head of the NAACP, were telling Jesse Owens, don't go to Berlin. People were boycotting it, you know, uh, because yeah. it's the fucking Nazis. It was 1936. They'd been in charge for yeah. three years. And they'd already yeah. done a bunch of horrible things. Uh, but basically the, the, the tenor of the movie is, well, yeah, if he hadn't gone to Berlin, he wouldn't have been able to have his amazing triumph, which, of course, you know, was a moment of, it's like a station of the cross and like the progression of racial feelings in America. And so he had to do it because it's like his personal triumph is worth more than any kind of, you know, collective action. And Lenny Riefenstahl yeah. getting to make her movie is like a step forward for women, regardless of the fact that it also helped buttress the Nazi regime. It's, it's liberal representation. And oh, it's, and... it's a it's a crystalline example of that. And I then, mean, and then there actually she were train... athletes. There's actually an interesting story that uh, that a number of anti-fascist athletes boycotted the Olympics in '36 and went to a and were going to go to a, a fascist an anti-fascist Olympic alternative in Barcelona, and a number of them were actually in the city when the nationalists rose up and tried to seize power in May of 1936, and some of them actually took guns and helped put down the rebellion in the city. Jesus. I mean, that's a kind of an interesting story. Yeah. Think. But that's the kind of like collective action and like sacrifice in the in for the idea of like principles that would just not register for a contemporary Hollywood movie, and certainly not a contemporary Hollywood movie about sports. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, how did how did Lenny Riefenstahl try to um, uh, rebrand later and try and you know wash that uh that little stink of Nazi off of her? Uh, later in her career, she went and took a bunch of very famous photographs of, um, uh, I think they were the Nuba were they, people, uh, and they're like, yeah. Were they, the, were they so, Maasai? I, think, I, I, I can't remember. I think they were Maasai tribesmen or something. They were tribesmen, and first of all, like, the, the photography itself still has that like Riefenstahl like weird idealized body thing where it's just kind of creepy though because it's like kind of it, uh, it, she poses them and it very like much others their nakedness and there's all this shit it, they're very weird photographs they look like um, they look like Vogue photographs like they look like from like the 80s from like the late 80s early 90s like they look like um, you know Cindy Crawford would be standing next to them you know, in like an Armani dress or something. Hmm. Like they look like that very unwoke fashion. Photography United Colors of Benetton. Use, yeah, where they would just use like brown and black people as like you know, uh, you know, accessories to the shot. Um, but 
so a- allegedly one of the people that was like following her around and you know documenting her documentation of these people or whatever said um you know they, they were filming her and uh she you know she was so moved at one point that she started weeping and then she noticed the camera wasn't on and she snapped up and said turn the camera back on and then she started uh-huh. weeping again like she's <laughs> she's just the, but again she's like oh well multiculturalism is in now um i'll just be super woke and take some pictures of some black people from far away Mm. Once again, it sounds like you're hating. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's I'm very a hater. disappointing. Yeah. Why are you gonna Why are you gonna hate on Lenny? She's just trying <laughs> to make it in a male dominated field. Yeah, she didn't make the rules. She's just, you know, she's just trying to get by. She's just trying to make her art. Yeah, uh, man. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, m- moving forward to a different Nazi. We got this transition right now. Uh, let's talk about the Disney movie, Cool Runnings. <laughs> uh, it's a very Nazi-heavy episode. Um, so, Cool Runnings, 1993, feel-good, multicultural little schmaltz based on the 1980 Winter Olympics in uh, Calgary. Um, I watched it with a bunch of Jacker people. I watched it with uh, Neil Meyer, the outreach coordinator, and Chris Mizano, contributing editor. Um, and w- w- we forgot to invite, because it was just sort of like last minute, uh, but Ramike Forbes, the designer of Jacobin, was actually Jamaican. Um, but we were texting him uh, throughout and uh because also we were sort of like we had but we had all seen this movie as like children and we were like i wonder if it's like horribly racist and we just didn't notice because we were kids um and i was actually pleasantly surprised it was not bad at all at Rumike had a, a a criticism that the um accents were like way off but like you know, you you've lived in a, a, in a West Indian neighborhood. I live in a West Indian neighborhood now. Obviously, like people code switch, but when Jamaicans yeah. speak patois to other Jamaicans, it it is not easy to understand. It would no yeah. longer be. They would have needed some, if they if they'd wanted yeah if they'd wanted realistic accents with them speaking within with amongst each other. They would have needed subtitles, no question. Yeah, it would it would be a foreign film then. Um, uh, but largely, like, I was kind of <laughs> impressed by it, and sort of, like, more actually by the success of it. I mean, it was Disney, um, but it was a movie, like, primarily centered on, like, four adult black men that, like, uh, uh, actually, like, made a hundred and forty million dollars. Like, it had, like, a fourteen million um, budget and uh, you know its box office was like 154 million, and it's a weird thing now. I, I actually kind of can't imagine. I can't think of any other movie like that. And I can't imagine a movie now getting made. It's like okay, so we're gonna make this movie for children, and the leads are gonna be John Candy, and four kids uh, love candy. Yeah, kids go crazy for him. <laughs> and. Uh, and and like four adult black men, like yeah, I don't think if that they would made, made that, that movie now, the coat the coach would be like uh, like fucking Taylor Lautner or somebody from oh, totally. Twilight or like from like that short kid from Hunger Games or something. Oh totally, and the beginning of it is very much like of its time. It like the the intro ha- like it has those like do the right thing lettering like that Afro yeah. lettering. That was <laughs> like, very popular. I think they had that too. In that other sports movie from that era, The Air Up There with Air, yeah. Kevin Bacon. I don't know oh, if you totally. remember that one. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, and, and it had, like, a good, like, Hans Zimmer uh, soundtrack. There are moments when, like, um, you, uh, you know, th- someone will say, can you imagine a Jamaican bobsled team? And then, like, Oh, my God, no way! 
and like What's almost breaking about? the fourth wall, like, and then like a steel drum plays. <laughs> <laughs> they never like directly looked at the camera or anything, like like cross eyed. <laughs> they came so close. Um. Uh. So yeah, I was actually kind of a surprise. Uh. There are of course. It is, like, pure Coca-Cola liberalism, though. Uh, their enemies in this are are the East Germans, the bad uh. guys. But they really G-rated their aggression uh, against, uh, against, you know, the Jamaican bobsled team. Like, I, like, first of all, if they had been terrible to them, they would not be like... Oh hey Jamaica! Like there would just be n words. Like <laughs> clearly, yeah, something. Yeah. But also, I mean, they're that's European for all... God's sake. Yeah, but also that's not at all what. Would I... If anyone would be nice to them, it would be the communists. As it would have said, they'd be like, uh, "We support your struggles against imperialism." Yes, absolutely. It would have been like, <laughs> "We hope that your country is able to one day to." To triumph over the forces that are arrayed <laughs> against you from the global hegemon to your north. Like, how much of it is just that, like, like so, uh, some of it I think is obviously red baiting. Uh, but how much of it is just that that accent sounds scary to us? Oh, it's so, it's so, oh, come on, it's so <laughs> creepy. It's just the creepy. German, especially, because remember, the East, Ger- East Germany, the, uh, like a large char- part of East Germany was Prussia. And the yep. Prussian accent, that's the scariest German accent. <laughs> Because, like, Bavaria and stuff, like, that's like the Schwarzenegger accent. That's like the Werner Herzog. So it's like you got a mouthful of bratwurst. Oh, yeah, but yeah. the Prussian accent is, yes, yeah, that's the we have ways of making you talk accent. Yeah, and yeah. And it's by so, far the most menacing yeah. one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, like, they're, there's, like, a, whatever. They, they, they make Rastafarianism us. References. There are so few Rastafarians in Jamaica, by the way. There are probably more Rastafarians in New York City than there are in Jamaica. Like, it's just, it's incredibly fringe religion. Uh, but like, are there any weed references? That's what I want to know. There are no re- weed references. Uh, which what the I thought fuck? was, yeah. There's tons of Coca Cola in it, too. Like, speaking of Coca Cola liberalism. Like, oh, man. Like if you got the Coca Cola, you don't need ganja. <laughs> The it does more for you, man. Um, I don't think they ever even like drink beer in it. Although they are at a bar at a very pivotal scene when they get in a bar fight with these Germans, and it's Calgary, which is like the kind of the Texas of Canada. Yes, like, yes, like, Alberta. Oil. Yeah, yeah. Tar the, sands, baby. Yeah, so they're at this like redneck bar, um, and it's supposed to be kind of fish out of water, but like I actually don't think it would be that much because like country music is very popular in jamaica this is a thing i learned from living here they love honky tonk um interesting yeah uh but yeah all this culminates in like a bar fight but they're not you know maybe they were drinking a beer i get it's also incredibly g-rated um but like so they're like at a bar but they're not even really drinking or anything yeah there's no there's no insinuation that, like, you got in a bar... Like, people get in bar fights because they get too drunk. People don't get in bar yeah. fights because bars make people aggressive, because the setting yeah. is aggressive. Like, yeah. you get too drunk and then you get aggro. Uh, but it's all, yeah. it's all very gentle. Um, that couldn't have happened in real life, though, right? They didn't fight <laughs> one of their other teams. Okay, well, I feel like let's people talk about found what out actually that. happened. Yeah, because that sounds highly unlikely. So, the actual... Uh, and you can look this up um on i think there's a there's a business insider article on it and i think there's a daily beast article on it um uh, about like the real uh jamaican bobsled team which i think real jamaican bobsled music (laughs) uh and you know what happened uh uh dudley stokes who was on the team he went on reddit and did like i think an ama oh Um, cool yeah. Okay. So it's completely made up. Everything is made up. Like God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to believe in anymore. <laughs> Let me just read you this part. Uh I got into bobsledding because I was told to go. I was in the army at the time. 
The colonel made the suggestion to me, and because I was captain, do as you're told and obey orders. There were two <laughs> Americans. Two Americans, George Finch and William Maloney, who were big into push cart racing and thought it translated well to bobsledding. By the way, push cart racing is a, like a big, it's like a box car derby stuff, and it's big in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. uh, you mix that with the Jamaican athleticism, and they thought it could work with some of our track athletes. They couldn't get anyone to actually do the sport, so they went to the Army and Colonel, and that's how I became involved in. Once there, I was hooked. So, like, in the movie, they're like, well, they just took a bunch of track athletes, and then, you know, that had uh, Olympic aspirations, but, like, you know, by pure happenstance like tripped during the qualifying run <laughs> and so they're just like well we'll just switch to this sport you know they just organically decide it and what do you know one of the uh great bobsledding uh coaches and and uh, olympic gold medal winners just happens to live on the island and it's john candy and he's gonna <laughs> trade him and uh, it's gonna have the uh, 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 push cart driver who happens to be the best friend of one of these people that wanted to be in the Olympics. It's gonna have him be their fourth man, and it's like, it's just all like you know, perfect serendipitous. Yeah. Uh, you know all this stuff. No, what happened is that uh, two American businessmen kind of like bullied the Jamaican army <laughs> into like <laughs> taking people like out of the I mean you know well recruiting people or whatever but I mean come on they said like do as you're told was like yeah I mean you're in the army <laughs> yeah you don't have a lot of options yeah and so like uh, obviously like I, I, we all love a training montage they have a yeah, there's the best. training montage um but like they trained pretty extensively in like Austria and like upstate New York um and uh, they didn't like they weren't like doing it in, in like uh, you know they got to be on ice um, they made it seem like they had no way of being on ice until they got to the Olympics also like the the way they sort of portrayed the sport is is very wrong they like made a lot of jokes like oh they can't walk on ice uh, <laughs> but like y you have spikes on your shoes yeah they're, right yeah they're like a cleat or whatever so, um, actually, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's actually, like, this very, and also, you know, by their own account, they're, like, we were treated incredibly well by the other athletes, like, there was, like, a feeling of camaraderie, everyone was kind to them, um, now, what actually did happen is that, is that, you know, they had this crash, and they did actually cross the finish line. They did not hold it above their heads the way they did in the Disney movie, but they, like, stood up and, like, pushed the bobsled across the finish line. They used actual crash footage, too, from the, you know, from the Olympics. See, that's good. More more, more sports movies should be willing to do that. Yeah, yeah. Because just, like, if you have the actual enough. footage, just use it. Yeah. Your goofy reenactment does not give it anything that it wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. And also, like, pushing over the finish line, like, that's still pretty moving. Holding it above the head just looks insane, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what are you doing? That's too much. Giant well, more, metal the question I have is realism question I have is when they were doing this, did the crowd go? The slow clap. <laughs> but it. it in the best, like, uh, way possible, in the most Coca-Cola liberalism way possible, like, who started the slow clap? The East Germans. Of course. Because then they respected them. Because Yeah, they... and guess what happened, like, uh, two, a year later? Wall came down? Yep. Boom. Yep. QED. Those things are, aren't unrelated. <laughs> mm, mm Yeah. Um... So, yeah, and also, like, it, it is a terrifying crash. They, like, lost control of it at, like, they're going like eighty-five miles per hour. Uh, and, yeah, it's like, insane. They Bob's like, all the those, sled. all those, all those, the ones that go down the, the, the track. All those Winter Olympic sports are insane. Yeah, they're those people are nuts. Insane. It looks when you look at it, you're like, oh, this looks fun as hell. Like it looks like a roller coaster on ice. But then you're like, oh, yeah. but like you can like break every bone in your body and die under the weight of this metal. It's almost yeah. To be honest kind of irresponsible 
Yeah. That what are these people, people doing? Like, oh, we're just going to throw some Jamaicans on there. It'll be novel. People will love it. You know, this Jamaicans, they're so naturally athletic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, two, uh, two Americans. There was no, there was no John Candy. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there is none of that. But it's a sweet movie, and for all its uh, kind of liberal bullshit, it's kind of well made. And it's like a, it's like a decent movie, you know. Uh, it's just, a, it's just a palace of lies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just can't wait for the inevitable remake starring Usain Bolt. That seems oh, like man. that's got to happen, right? It's like because he's he's going to be finishing with his career probably this is his last olympics most likely most successful track athlete basically ever yeah it's like this, and very the charismatic and it's like what world. do we do with this guy fastest man in the world what do we do with this guy some brain dead idiot after you know hoovering up an entire you know day's worth of coke at a movie studio you know they looked at that footage of him like getting interviewed after he won again and it's like cool runnings do it Bring yeah. it, that's that's it. We don't have to fake the accent. He could do it. Yeah, yeah, and it kills. So that cool seems like that's gonna happen. Was incredibly successful. It yeah, that's like, and that's it. Like they're always desperate. You know, it's like, oh, what do people recognize? Oh, people have good associations with that movie. They love Usain Bolt. Mm -hmm. That's a guaranteed box office hit. Let's make it happen. That's our. A... We're talking about it. It's already being talked about it. Oh, Those totally. papers are being signed. I guarantee totally. you that's going to happen. He hasn't had any scandals or anything. They can still keep it G-rated. Yep, yep. Or at least like a it's cartoon inevitable. or something. Something. There's, they're going to have to. they got to do something with him. Because he's, he, he's, like, he's not American, and that's really the issue. But it's like, that's why something like that would work. Because then you can sort of familiarize his foreignness to American audiences. It's like, hey, you guys remember these Jamaicans, right, that you enjoyed so much? Well, here's another one. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I think uh, Cool Runnings sounds like it's so much less offensive than the Jesse Owens movie. Well, I mean, it does not have any parts where it's, it, it takes a leading Nazi propagandist <laughs> And makes her sort of like Melanie Griffith in Working Girl. So I'm going to go with, yeah, it's way less offensive than, than the Jesse Owens movie. It's, it's pretty so astounding. Weird. I went into it thinking like, oh, they're going to make like these like cartoonish. And I knew, actually, I had researched ahead of time that it like the story was bullshit. Uh, but, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely one of those people that doesn't... Um, it's not that I don't fault... Uh, biographical movies for taking liberties or whatever mm -hmm. I, I just have also a secondary sort of consideration for them where it's right. just like this is not a good biography uh, but you know for fucking Disney movie for kids it's it's fine it's completely fine it's totally it's an acceptable uh, piece of children's entertainment uh, you know made uh, in the legacy of a man who uh, hit Nazis. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, so we've discovered so today that of the movies we talked about, the one that's the most insidious and problematic piece of propaganda is the feel-good Jesse Owens wins the race movie. Absolutely. Followed, followed by the actual Nazi propaganda <laughs> with and Cool then, Runnings, yeah. the Disney film, well in the rear. Yeah, yeah. So that's the gold... Gold for race, silver for Olympia, and bronze for Cool Runnings in the yeah. cool vile runnings. propaganda event. Cool Runnings that only really manages to, um, you know, uh, red bait and not and, and 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 be a Disney movie. Like that's yeah. That's there's only you know it's just bourgeois entertainment. Yeah. Like it's, relatively it's, low yeah. on the uh, yeah on the cri cinematic crime scale. Yeah. Yeah. Better, okay. Certainly better than whitewashing a Nazi propagandist. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, All right. Well, we covered our three. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, I think it's pretty good for two people who uh, we don't watch the sports ball. 
Not we, really. Ugh, sports ball. We, Give me a break. We read books. Maybe you've heard yeah. of them. Well, I mean, blog posts, but that's close <laughs> enough. So, okay, yes, I, I give us... Comment section. <laughs> I, I give us uh, both gold medals for open-mindedness and, uh, and insights. So, hooray. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks uh, so much for listening, and we'll see you next Absolutely. time. Absolutely. See you guys next week.